What is up, Film Geeks? My name is Trevor, and welcome back to my channel, and welcome back to another tier ranking video. It's been a while since we've done one of these, but today we're going to be placing all 20 movies I've seen in the year 2020 on their proper tiers. Go ahead and share down below in the comment section how many 2020 movies have you guys seen. I know it's a sad year. We haven't got to see a lot of movies we've been wanting to see, like Tenet, Wonder Woman, Countless of others, No Time to Die, Black Widow, Need I Go On, it's kind of a sad year in terms of that, but I've still been able to see 20, 20, 20 movies, so go ahead and share your guys' take on it down below in the comment section, and with that said, let's go ahead and get into our tiers, and first up, we have Amazing, then we have Great, then we have Good, then we have Meh, then we have Bad, and these movies are in no particular order, lots of them went straight to VOD, lots of them went straight to Netflix, a couple that went to Hulu and Apple TV+, Plus. and with that said, let's go ahead and get started, and first up, we have the lovebirds and it seems every year there is a romantic comedy that comes out that's pretty dang good in 2019 or 2018 we had crazy rich asians 2019 we had long shot and this year looking like we have the lovebirds and i'm gonna put lovebirds in the good tier i had quite a bit of fun with this one i didn't think it was as funny as i kind of wanted it to be most of the funniest moments are in the trailer and that's okay a lot of romantic comedies are but it felt like a romantic comedy it was Funny at times, Kamal Nanjiani, he has a lot of just charismatic of him, and you kind of like, you like him a lot, and anything he really does, so, it's always harmless, it's fun, it went straight to Netflix, if I saw it in theater, I think it would have been a lot harder on it, but, since it went straight to Netflix, uh, I had quite a bit fun with Lovebirds. Next up, we have Tom Hanks and Greyhound, and this is another movie going in the good tier. Um... This movie is very simple, and but it's very entertaining. And the script, everyone's like, the script isn't good because Tom Hanks wrote it. It's just a terrible script. But I don't think it was really going for that. I think it was going for a very engaging, intense, entertaining film. And that's what it was. It was intense. I was engaged. And I was entertained. And I, when I got done watching it, I said, that wasn't great by any means. But it was a solid movie nonetheless. People, I think, may have gone in with too high of expectations because it is Tom Hanks. But I had a good time. I was entertained. I was engaged. And... I, I, I was, I, it was intense, and I, I'm okay with that, so, the Greyhound isn't perfect, it isn't amazing, it's not gonna win a lot of Oscars, but, if you guys are looking for something to watch, Greyhound is pretty dang good. Next up, we have Netflix's The Old Guard, another movie going in the good tier. Uh, Charlize Theron, obviously, is a standout here, the script for this movie is not atrocious, but it's definitely its weakest aspect, and I knew nothing about this film going in, and I think that's why I was so surprised. Um, Charlie Theron, again, is great. The rest of the cast is okay, but this group of immortals is so kind of, like, entertaining and engaging, and something about them is enthralling. You want to, like, know more a little bit about them, and when they die, you're like, okay, are they done? Are they not done? And you get to see that they are never really that done, so... Um, there's a little bit of love twist and turns in there. Um, one of the girls who they end up saving to me was not a good actress at all. But The Old Guard was, again, for a Netflix movie, pretty dang entertaining. So, Charlie Theron, again, I love her in anything she does. Next up, we have Dave Franco's directorial debut, The Rental. And when I first saw this, I was like, nah, not that big of a fan. But the more I sat on it, the more I thought about it, The Rental's in the go in the good tier as well. I can't believe I'm putting all the first four movies in all the good tiers, but The Rental has potential and the rental shows that Dave Franco behind the camera has potential and the one thing I can say about this movie is by the end of it by after like the little post credit scene it had too is that I felt kind of creeped out and I don't think Airbnb will ever get my business I don't think I'll ever waste money going there and I'll stay in a hotel because Airbnb after seeing this I felt creeped out and I guess that was something that was probably going for, but this is labeled like a horror movie, and it's more of a drama thriller, because there's so much drama between these two couples, between the relationships, people are doing things they're not supposed to be doing, there's people with each other who aren't supposed to be together, so lots of stuff like that, and I think the budget really held this movie back from being better than it actually was. We had some really moments that could have been terrifying, but had to cut away, obviously I'm guessing because the budget didn't allow it, but... Um, a decent movie, that not great, and I think it kind of didn't really know what it was really going for. Was it more of a thriller type, or was it more of a slasher horror type? And it kind of led to more like the slasher movie rather than horror, and also kind of more of a thriller rather than horror. It was it's kind of a mess uh, all over the place in terms of genre, but a simple movie is an hour and a half, and the first hour is a little slower, builds up, but the last half an hour keeps you pretty engaged and has that thriller aspect to it. It kind of keeps you on the edge of your seat, so... The rental isn't perfect, but I think Dave Franco has a future in this genre as well. As long as he kind of works on some kinks, maybe gets a little bit of a bigger budget, I would be very excited to see what Dave Franco does next. Next up is Netflix's The Wrong Missy, a Happy Madison's production. Uh, five movies in a row going in the good tier. The Wrong Missy is funny. 
I don't care what anyone says. People think it's annoying, and it is annoying. Trust me, Missy is an annoying character, but we get kind of put in the shoes of David Spade. He's annoyed. He's just, like, overwhelmed with her, and that's how we feel. We're annoyed and overwhelmed, and I like that. If I put you put yourself in David Spade's shoes, you really feel how he feels, and then he kind of starts breaking down her barriers and finds out she's actually a person. He starts to have feelings for her. It's cliche. It's silly. It's kind of dumb, but... It's pretty funny. It is over top of the time. I get. I get it. I was annoyed throughout this film as well. But the wrong Missy to me was a. It was a solid enough film to earn the good category. Next up is Scoob, and I'm gonna put Scoob in meh. I did not hate this movie, but I did not love it like I wanted to. Um, I am a huge Scooby Doo fan. Scooby Doo Two: Monsters Unleashed, one of my favorite, probably childhood movies of all time. So, going in to see this, I kind of really wanted the original cast, especially the original cast voice for Shaggy, because that's such an iconic voice, and the voice of Shaggy for this film just didn't do it for me, but it's cute, it's sweet, it's honestly harmless, and if I was younger or I had kids, I think I would have enjoyed it a lot more, and maybe one day when I do have kids, five years down the line, I will show them this movie, and we'll all love it together, but it's a family movie, it's family fun, kind of for everyone, Scoob is harmless, to say the least. Next up is Dave Bautista's My Spy. This one is, it's a weird one because it's kind of frustrating because it doesn't really know what it's going for. I'm going to put My Spy in meh. And what I mean by it doesn't know what it's going for, at times it seems like it's going to be like the game plan. And when it was seeming like it was going to be like the game plan, I enjoyed it. But then also, it seems to have a lot more of adult humor and adult language. Several times they are swearing, using cuss words, and which is fine. But this seems to be a movie more gravitated to like a family audience. Like, oh, we're going to sit down on Saturday night with our family. We're going to watch this with our kids. It's going to be funny. It's going to be like the game plan. The little girl in this movie looks exactly like the girl in the game plan. And I think they kind of thought that. So then they said, oh, we're going to throw some adult humor in there and make it PG-13. If this was a PG movie and made for families, it would have been a lot better. Every time they would swear or something would happen, I would just get thrown off. And remember when Dave Bautista said he doesn't want to do Fast and Furious movies because he wants to do good movies? Um... I wonder if this is what he meant by a good movie. I'm not hating on the guy. I just I think it was a poor choice, poor choice of words on his part. But it's it's okay to say the least. Next up, I'm not gonna lie. This is one of the most overhyped movies in my my life. I think uh, Palm Springs. I'm a romantic comedy guy. I love romantic comedies, and I was not that excited for this. I didn't really know what it was about, but uh, I was enthralled. I was in, uh, I was intrigued by it. So. Palm Springs is going in bad, and I know this is a lot of people's top five. I know a lot of my buddies have it in their top five. I don't know what everyone thought about Palm Springs. To me, it is awful. To me, I did not understand anything that was going on, and not even like by the point like, oh, you're confused by this movie. No, I understand it's that Groundhog Day kind of effect, but it's like a sci-fi movie. We have like dinosaurs in there. J.K. Simmons is hunting Andy Samberg with a bow and arrow, and I... Like, Certain things I just I just wasn't about, and it kind of like really caught me off guard. And like I think you had to be uh, um, on board with those things to enjoy this film. I wasn't on board with those things to enjoy this film. I'm not the biggest Andy Samberg fan either, so that might have held me back a little bit. But the first ten minutes of this film, it really kind of just throws you in there. Like we're we supposed to know who these characters are. Andy Samberg's unhappy in his relationship, and he gives a huge speech. Like we're supposed to know that he's a loser, and he's not a loser, and he's giving a speech. It all kind of gets thrown in there in the first six minutes. We didn't have a little build-up as to who our characters were. Um, that's kind of my mini-review on Palm Springs. Not a fan. I, I don't know what it is. Not a fan. Uh, next up, we have Capone. Uh, starring Tom Hardy. Oh, gosh. Capone is also going into bad. Um, I've, t- I've done a review for this film, and Tom Hardy... <laughs> he's just munting, he's groaning, and... Um, it's, it's weird. It's a really weird direction to go for Al Capone, a notorious gangster, one of the America's most notorious gangster on the last year of his life. And if you think about it, it's kind of maybe going for something more like, hey, he actually is human. He's dying from dementia, like 50 years old. How good he's feeling. Tom Hardy's probably pretty good in his role. Um, but this film is just boring and it's weird. And they go on these 20 minute, like, acid kind of trips but they're dreams but it feels like it's like an acid trip in a film and you're watching all this happen before your eyes and you're like is this real then we find out it's not real uh frustrating to say the least so if you guys haven't seen Capone like just do yourself a favor don't waste the 20 dollars to rent it because yeesh speaking of yeesh we have 365 D&I um bad and we're gonna leave it at that uh I like the soundtrack I liked how the ending tried to really go for something. It fell f- flat on its face, but it really tried. It was a, it was ambitious, but this film may, has like Fifty Shades franchise, which is like very sexual and very adult, mature, like adult content, has nothing on this film. This film is graphic, and it's 
kind of gross, and I, I felt really weird when I watched it, and I can't believe I did watch it. So, 365. I'm gonna I'm gonna put my money on it that we're gonna get a sequel because everyone talked about it, and it was number one on Netflix for quite some time. Now we're gonna hop over to Happy Land Hamilton. I know some people aren't counting Hamilton as a 2020 film. I am. Hamilton is amazing. I cannot talk about how amazing this is. I listen to the soundtrack literally daily. The song nonstop. I sing it and I listen to it nonstop. Jonathan Groff is King George. Lynn Manuel is Alexander Hamilton. Leslie Odom Jr. is Aaron Burr. How do I need to go on? I love this thing so much, and I, I, I can't wait to one day when everything reopens to be able to go see this on a Broadway production. Hopefully, like in New York, I can go see Hamilton live. I've seen it seven times. I love it so much. I, I can't gush about it anymore. If you, if you guys aren't into musicals, if you guys aren't into these theatrical productions, I'm telling you, you will be. Everyone I always not, and I told them to watch this, watched it, and they loved it. Hamilton is perfect. Hamilton is freaking uh, it's so amazing. Oh, gosh. Back to the negatives, folks. Here we are. Artemis Fowl. Remember Artemis Fowl? I'm bad. Um, I don't know what I was going for. I, this is a movie that Disney Plus, you can see, is just embarrassed. And sometimes if I make a YouTube video and I'm not happy with it, I don't post it. I wonder why movies sometimes are like, hey, I'm not happy with this. Why are we going to post it? I get it costs a lot more money to make a movie than it does a YouTube video. But, um, yeah, it really got dumped on Disney Plus and everyone just trashed it. It is, it is awful. It is uh, probably, it's down there with the four that are down there. It might be, the, I think it's the worst of all four of those. And that's saying something. Next up, the Back in Positive Land, my favorite movie of the year if we're discounting Hamilton. If we don't count Hamilton as a favorite uh, 2020 movie, The Gentleman is my favorite movie of the year. I have seen this movie seven times. I love it. And I hope we get Oscars just so that Colin Farrell can get nominated just for his role because he is so good in this. I wish we got to see a little bit more of him and I was okay that we didn't. He was one of the best supporting actors uh, roles I've seen in a long time. Love Matthew McConaughey. He's great. Henry Golden is great. Hugh Grant is fantastic. And Guy Ritchie, I love everything Guy Ritchie does. First off, uh, King Arthur, Legend of the Sword. You have Aladdin. You have uh, the Sherlock Holmes movies. Then you go all the way back to Snatch. I mean, this is Snatch days, and this is Guy Ritchie at his best. The Gentleman might be his best movie. It is my one of my favorite movies probably ever, and it's my favorite movie of the year, not in counting Hamilton. I love The Gentleman so much. Uh, it's great. Next up, Pixar's movie, probably one of the few Disney movies we're going to get for the rest of the year, Onward. Onward has to go an amazing top probably three of the year for me. Uh, it's emotional. I got to see this a week early when theaters were open. <laughs> the good old days. I can still kind of taste it. Uh, I got to see this a week early at Fandango, and I was so happy that I did. I I just loved everything they did about it. I was more excited for this than I was for Soul. I love everything Pixar does, and Ian and Barley are some really likable kids and really likable characters, and uh, by the end when uh, Ian, fi Ian finds out that basically Barley was his dad and like he kind of realizes that, it brought me to tears. It truly did. A uh, good brother story will always do that to me, and uh, I love Onward. I loved it so much, and I really miss the theaters. When I think of this, I think of a little girl screaming when I'm trying to cry. That's what I think, but uh, I really w really want to go back to theaters. Next up, we have The Invisible Man, another movie I got to see in theaters this year, and that's going in amazing. Um... First off, Lee Winnell is great. From Upgrade to writing Saw to do it from directing Upgrade to now directing The Invisible Man. Seven million dollar budget, I believe, and look what he did. I mean, perfection. A fantastic movie. It is so intense and does such a good job of building tension, especially the first ten minutes alone when she tried to escape out of this like billion dollar mansion. She's trying to escape and it's so dark and he has such good shot selection, but also then it's like so quiet, you're expecting him to jump out. She'll kick a dog ball, and that'll make you jump more than any other time in the film. Such a good job of building tension. My only critique with this film is at times the when the Invisible Man is in his suit doing things, he seems more like a supernatural entity rather than a person who's actually invisible. How he moves, how he does certain things, it seems more, again, like he's a ghost rather than a, uh, than a person. So that's a, I don't think that's a nitpick. I think it's a pretty fair critique, but the Invisible Man, other than that, is a dang near flawless, and it's, uh, it's spooky. It, it'll get you for sure. Next up, we have The Way Back. Gavin O'Connor, I think, is my favorite working director. I love everything he does. He's made, to me, Miracle, Warrior, The Accountant, now The Way Back, uh, all perfect movies. So, The Way Back is going in amazing. 
Best we've seen Ben Affleck since Good Will Hunting. Uh, this might not be the best we've seen Gadam McConner, but it's dang close. A very emotional movie that's not too focused on sports this time around. Obviously, Warrior, we get some epic MMA fights. Miracle is all about sports. And the Accountant has some amazing action. But this is more following someone who has is dealing with alcoholism, depression, a loss. And we get to really see that. And this is Ben Affleck's movie. What a way for him to come back into the, um, to the acting world. Uh, I can't speak highly or, uh, higher enough about this film. It is so emotional and so it's so sweet and it's inspiring and the effect he has on his kids. If you had a coach or a teacher or like a friend or someone who's kind of like a role model like he was to you, uh, you'll really relate with this film. And I had some good coaches and some good teachers that I can really relate to, like how he related to these kids. Uh, it's a fantastic movie. I, I love every second of it. Next up is Birds of Prey. Birds of Prey has to go on amazing. I had so much fun with this, and I'm a DCEU fan. So, that, I'm a full disclaimer there. I know some people aren't, and if you aren't, this movie's not for you. It's cheesy. It's fun. But Roman Sionis, uh, Black Mask, Ewan McGregor, come on. All day. Give me some more. One of my favorite movie villains of the year. Not saying much. Haven't seen that many movies, but still probably my favorite movie villain of the year. And Harley Quinn, her relationship with a sandwich. Every time I think about that scene, I want that sandwich. I just do. I'm hungry now. But... Birds of Prey is fun, it's funny, it's action-packed. It should have just been called Harley Quinn, as everyone says, not Birds of Prey and Family's Match Page, but one Harley Quinn. Um, other than that, the, the, the biggest critique of the film is its name, and I think it's a pretty dang good movie. Next up is The King of Staten Island. The King of Staten Island is going in great. When I first saw this movie, I gave like a 98%, and I decided after I saw it that I'm not going to rate movies anymore. I'm just going to recommend them or not, because recency bias is a thing. And then I rewatched it after, and I still really enjoyed it. Then I watched it a third time, and it went down quite a bit. Certain problems I didn't have before started to arise, but let's talk about the positives. A really, really good at Judd Apatow film. Pete Davidson has some range as an actor. He is um, very dramatic in here, but he's also very funny. Obviously, he is a funny person in general, but really shows his, uh, his um, range as an actor. So, The King of Staten Island is funny. It's relatable. Not much of a plot, not much of a serious movie. Definitely more of an indie-type film, but definitely a great movie nonetheless. Next up is To All the Boys I Loved Before, and this film is going to go in the... Uh, we're going to put it in the good tier. I like these movies. I like the first one, and I like this one probably a little bit better because I'm a big Jordan Fisher fan, but a very fun film. It's very sweet. It's high school, so it's kind of cheesy, but Noah Centineo is a heartthrob. Uh, Peter Kavinsky. I love Kavinsky, man. He's a, he's a heartthrob. I, if, I was, if I went back to high school, I'd try to be like him. It's funny. It's cute. It's sweet. It's a romantic movie. It's a romantic high school movie. If you guys don't like those, you won't like this. I like those, so I liked it. It's going in good. And last up is going to be Extraction. And Extraction is going to have to go in great. When I first saw it, I was like, oh, God, another stupid um, another stupid action movie. doesn't really have a plot. But the choreograph in this freaking movie is awesome. The choreography, I mean, it's just it's flawless. I mean, the scene where they're in the street and Chris Hemsworth having like a fist a knife fight with this guy is just engaging. It's intense. It's action-packed. And if they fall out of a building or they get hit by a car, they don't just hop up right away like, well, screw it. Let's keep going. Like, no. They sit down for a minute like, no. Wow, that hurt. And um, a very cool ending where we get to see, spoiler alert, that he, in the background, we are assuming that he is still alive. Uh, Extraction, I believe, is the number one viewed de Netflix film of all time. 99 million views. Might be higher than that now. So I'm guessing we're going to get a sequel. Chris Hemsworth, I, I can't wait to see what he does next. I'm a big fan of his. And that's going to do it for all 20, 2020 movies I saw ranked. Thank you guys so much for watching. Make sure to comment down below your guys' list. What movies have you seen in 2020 year? How many movies have you seen in 2020 year? Do you miss theaters? And if you guys are still watching, I really do appreciate it. Make sure to hit that thumbs up button and hit that subscribe button. Lots more content coming this week. We got Netflix reviews, Netflix show review. Finally jumping into some TV shows and Blu-ray hauls and every movie I I watched in the month so lots of awesome stuff coming that way make sure to subscribe and i'll see you guys next time